On behalf of Karen and the family, I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you for your cards, your support, your prayers, and your love. Everything that you've done has been a tremendous help and encouragement through this difficult time, and your presence here today is greatly appreciated. In the mid-1800s, the famed England preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon had to officiate at a funeral service for a man from his church whom he loved. And he told this story. There was a wealthy owner of a palatial estate who hired a gardener to take care of his garden. This gardener took his work seriously and especially was fond of roses that he had seen grown. He planted the roses. He cared for the roses. He saw them grow and bloom into all of their beauty. He was especially fond of one rose. It stood out from all the rest. It was his favorite. One morning that gardener came to his garden and discovered that his favorite rose had been taken away. And he was livid. He wanted to find out who took the rose away and why. He went to all of his fellow servants and he said to each one of them, why did you take away my one special rose? He was angry, he was churning inside until one of the servants said to the gardener, we didn't take it, the owner did. We saw him walking in the garden early this morning and he selected that specific rose and took it away. It was his rose to do what he wanted to do with, he decided it was time to take it away. The thing that gives me comfort at this service is that I totally and completely believe in the providential sovereignty of God over things I can't explain and over things I cannot explain. The reason why I believe this is because this is exactly what the Bible says concerning life and concerning death. Job said in Job, man who is born of woman is short-lived, his days are determined. The number of his months is with thee and his limits thou hast set so that he cannot pass. Hannah in 1 Samuel said, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. Jesus said that two sparrows are sold for a cent, and yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from our Heavenly Father. And then he went on to say in that very same context that the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I believe in the providential sovereignty of God, even down to the very hairs on a person's head. I believe in the providential sovereignty of God in a death I cannot explain. I cannot explain why one person dies one way and another person dies a different way, but I do believe in the providential sovereignty of God. When I first learned of the circumstances of Mike's death, I was like the gardener. I was livid and I was angry that his life was gone and I was angry about how his life ended. I was upset because of where this left Karen. I was upset because where this left his family. I was upset because where this left our church. But as I began to think through this biblically, and as I began to think through this theologically, I came to realize that there is a sovereign God who's still on his throne. And that sovereign God is truly Mike's owner. And for some mysterious, unknown, unexplainable sovereign reason, God permitted Mike to enter his presence on Monday, April 20th. Over these uh, past days, as I, like many of you, have pondered and wondered and cried and grieved, I've come to the conclusion it's not for me to question the owner. The fact is, God was Mike's owner. The keys of life and death are in his hands. The whys, the hows, the whens, and the wheres of a person's death are his business. What I do know is that just like the gardener, it was my privilege, it was our privilege, to have known and seen that rose blossom for a while while he was here on earth. We saw the Holy Spirit give birth to Mike. We saw the Spirit of God cause him to blossom in the things of the Lord for a while. It was our privilege to know him. It was our privilege to love him. And it is our privilege to have seen this beautiful rose for a short time. And for that, we may all be thankful. May we pray. Our Father, we bow before thy presence today with the utmost reverence for thy sovereignty. We rest in the fact that you are the supreme ruler of and over all things. We rest in the fact that you are God and, as the psalmist says, you do whatever you please. 
The reason this is such a precious doctrine to us this hour is because you know we're left with questions to which we have no answers. We're left with hearts that have hurt because a dear man, a dear husband, a dear son, brother, and friend is gone. All of us here loved Mike. What we ask, God, is that you would impart to us your sovereign grace and peace. Grant us a strengthening and development of our faith. May your sovereign Holy Spirit minister to Karen and to Mike's family and to all who are here. We pray that you would use this service to strengthen us and to resolve to live our lives and finish our lives in a way that honors you. Use this service to help mend broken hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Michael Doe was born on January 25, 1957, here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He was the son of Dale and Sylvia Doe. He was a son, a grandson, a brother, a husband, a father, and a friend. When he died on Monday, April 20, he left behind many people who loved him, cared about him, and who are hurting today because he's gone, people who will deeply miss him. He leaves behind his wife, Karen, who, as you will hear, was uh, very instrumental in any eternal hope we have here today. He leaves behind his children, his daughter, Kelly, and his three stepchildren, Andy, Greg, and Liz. He leaves behind his parents, Dale and Sylvia. He leaves behind his brothers, Rick and Barry, and their wives, Diane and Allie. The brothers love Mike. In fact, Barry named his two twin boys after Mike. He leaves behind his sisters, Deb and Dee Dee, and their husbands, Dan and Jean. He leaves behind his grandparents, Lloyd and Dorothy. He leaves behind many nieces, nephews, and friends. And he leaves behind a church family who truly loved him and who will deeply miss him. He trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior on May 19, 2002, in a Sunday morning service right here in this church. In the Bible, there are six individuals who took their own lives. Five of them are found in the Old Testament, Abimelech, Samson, Saul, Ahithophel, and Zimri. One of them is found in the New Testament, Judas. Of the six, I believe three of them are in heaven and three of them aren't. Now the thing that is important to see when you carefully crawl through those passages that describe those individuals is that there is much more given about their life than their death. And in some cases, you can track their life and you can find the choices they made which led to the sad conclusion. That's what's so different about Mike. When you track his life in the past six or seven years, it was a life filled with many wonderful positive blessings. He had a personality that truly did honor the Lord in many ways. He developed qualities as a man that are not only just special qualities, they're very biblical qualities. And I'll give you four. First of all, he was a man who had a wonderful sense of humor. He uh, loved to make people laugh. In fact, his brother Rick and sister Deb said he was the family comedian. He loved to tease people in a good way. All of us in this church can certainly testify of that. You know, laughter is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a blessing from God. Solomon said there's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. Solomon said that laughter is good medicine to the soul, and Mike was good medicine to everyone whose life he touched because he had such a wonderful sense of humor. One of his family members said the first time you meet Mike, you like Mike because he's just fun to be around. But may I remind us all of something else Solomon said in Proverbs. He said, even in laughter, the heart may be in pain. We uh, all love people who can make us laugh, and that probably is one of the reasons we all love Mike. He was friendly, he was witty. But may we always remember that sometimes those who are making us laugh are covering up hurting hearts. Just because one is smiling on the outside does not mean they are on the inside. I think there's a good lesson for us to learn here, and that is this. When God brings people into our lives during the day, even for a few moments, we really don't know exactly what they are thinking or how they're hurting. A person could seem to have a great personality and be vivacious. A person could seem to have a great life and be on top of the world and yet be broken inside. No one had any way of knowing the emotional trouble that was taking place in Mike's mind. His wife didn't know. 
his co-workers didn't know and we at the church didn't know. It seems to me that the best thing we can do is try just a little bit harder to be a little kinder and a little more tender-hearted to each other. Perhaps we could try just a little harder to be more encouraging to one another, not knowing exactly what that person is going through. We may never know what an encouraging word or an uplifting praise can mean to somebody else because sometimes in laughter there is a heart that is hurting. But there's no question Mike did have a wonderful sense of humor. Secondly, Mike loved the outdoors. He was a guy who just liked to be outside. He loved God's creation. He liked to hunt and fish. He and his brother fished together many times. In fact, one time they were fishing down the Kalamazoo River and stopped so Mike could get some donuts and when he came back he fell and the donuts floated down the Kalamazoo River. (laughs) Knowing Mike, I asked Rick, did he retrieve them and eat them? (laughs) He said, absolutely not. Then I said, well, did you ever eat fish from the Kalamazoo River? He said, never. He said, they just like to be outdoors. They just like to catch the fish and let them go. You know, Jesus was one who loved the outdoors. In fact, you'll see that uh, on these pictures of the collage page that you'll have a chance to look at later, there are pictures of Mike fishing, and that subject of fish and fishermen and fishing shows up 70 times in the Bible. Jesus was one who knew a lot about fishing. He miraculously one time fed a group of over 5,000 men plus the women and children by using a couple of fish. He called uh, several fishermen to be his disciples, and there were times when he actually orchestrated things so they could catch fish. Mike liked fishing. He liked the outdoors. He loved God's world. That is a quality always worth remembering. But you know, there's an odd verse about fishing in the book of Ecclesiastes. And it says, Moreover, man does not know his time like fish caught in a treacherous net So the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. The contextual point of that is that we should do everything at the best possible level that we we can, but we always should keep the Lord at the center of our lives because we just don't know how long we have to live. Even when we are in moments of enjoying life like fishing, we just don't know how long we have to live. So the writer of Ecclesiastes says, you keep God at the center of your life. But that was a good thing that he liked God's creation and he liked the outdoors. There's a third quality that Mike had. He was a dedicated worker, a disciplined worker. Uh, Whether it was working on his yard or some other project, he was a very dedicated man to his tasks. It didn't matter what he gave himself to do. He did it at the best level that he could. He was very, very skilled with his hands, and that quality was seen at a very early age. He and his brother each had new Stingray bicycles. They took them apart, they customized them, and made them into choppers at a young age. I can't figure out how to even change the tire. But he could take them apart and develop this bike. He was skilled with his hands. He took apart a a truck, an old 1972 F-150. He completely rebuilt it, and he he made it so it would run fast. He was proud of it. In fact, he was so proud that one day he met his mother in a parking lot, and he wanted to race his mother. And he was so proud (laughs) until she beat him. (laughs) He loved the truck, but he never wanted to race again. He was a printer by trade. He was a, a loyal, hard-working printer for D&D printing. And as a church, we have used them on many, many projects, and they do excellent work. He was a big part of that. He was a builder, a skilled builder. He could remodel anything, build it from scratch. No matter what he did, no matter what he built, he took his work seriously. He took pride in his work. He liked the look of work alone. He didn't need somebody standing around watching over him to get the work done. He knew what had to be done, and he went about doing it. You know, the Bible says that a man's work abilities are from the Lord. His skills are from the Lord. The Bible says that a man should learn to do his work well, not to please men, but to please God. In fact, the scriptures say that a man should work hard at what he does, and he shouldn't have to have somebody standing around him, watching over him, telling him what to do. He should just be doing his best for God. And that's the way Mike worked. Whatever the project, he gave it his best. The fourth quality is that 
Mike was a believer in Jesus Christ. Mike trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior on a Sunday morning service, May 19, 2002, right here in the sanctuary. The key human agent that God used in the process was his wife, Karen. You can thank God today that Mike is in heaven, but you can thank Karen because she was a big influence in getting him to come to church. You see, Mike met Karen at a health club, and he wanted her to go someplace with him on a Sunday, and Karen said no. I spend my Sundays in church, Sunday morning and Sunday night. Mike said, well, could I come to church? Karen said, yes. He started coming to church with her, and on May 19th, he trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. On June 1st of 2003, Mike and Karen were both baptized in this church, and on June 8, 2003, they were married in this church. Karen is the one who bought him his Bible. She was a critical factor in Mike being with the Lord right now, and that's what really gives us eternal hope here today, because Mike had believed on Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand what I mean by that. He believed that Jesus Christ was the only person who can save him from his sins. Now, just because a person is a believer doesn't mean that believers sometimes don't do foolish things and make foolish decisions. What believers need to realize is I can lean on the Lord when I find myself in times of trouble. I can obey the word of God, but sometimes believers lose sight of that and they don't do that. Every day we all make choices and sometimes we make wrong choices. What this situation communicates to every one of us is it's serious when you're making those choices every day because if you make enough wrong choices, it can end in tragedy. What every believer ought to do when they're overwhelmed by something, what every believer ought to do when they find themselves in dark and deep despair is run right to the Lord. But not all believers choose to do that, and this is one of those cases. In these final days, when Mike found himself in dark despair, instead of drifting to the Lord, he drifted away from the Lord. In fact, we've learned that... Uh, there may be some variable things that came into play on that drifting away that was toying with his mind. But thank God he made the right choice back in 2002. Because all of the hope we have concerning him today is based on his decision to trust Jesus Christ. And even though his last choice on earth was a sinful choice, he is still with the Lord. Because the Apostle Paul said, even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the key to us going to heaven is not about our works. It's about Christ's work. It's not Mike's death that determines if one goes to heaven. It's Christ's death that determines if one goes to heaven. And Mike's last decision that he made on earth was a bad one. But the decision that he made in 2002 was the best one he ever made in all of his life. Because of that decision he made in this service, in this church, to believe on Jesus Christ, the moment he died, he was instantly in heaven. And I don't know of any better biblical definition of what happens at the moment a person dies than what is stated by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.8. He says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. At the moment that immaterial part of a person leaves that body for the believer, he's instantly in the presence of the Lord. Now what I find intriguing about that whole passage is that Paul chooses to select one word to describe heaven. And the word that he chooses to select in that context to describe heaven is the word home, home. Paul says, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. And the particular word that he uses there is a very rare word, which means the moment you get there, you realize this is where I belong. This is where I live. While we're here on earth, we're really not home. As a believer, we're just pilgrims and sojourners and strangers passing through life. Paul, in thinking about that, said, I have a big desire. I want to go home to be with Christ, which is a far better existence. So the picture God gives us of what happens when a Christian dies is that immediately he leaves this body and he goes home. 
Now you may ask me a million questions about heaven, and probably most of them I cannot answer for you. But this much I can tell you with dogmatic certainty. When a believer in Jesus Christ dies and finally gets to heaven, he is home. In that moment that Mike departed this world and went to heaven, he instantly knew he was home. There are millions and millions of believers in heaven. No two personalities are alike. Mike Doe is the only Mike Doe there. God designed him. God saved him. He's now home. That unique personality of his, his intellect, his emotions, his will are now free from any sin pollution. His hurts, his pains, his emotional turmoil is gone because Mike is now home with the Lord. And even though, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot put an award-winning spin on the way Mike went to heaven, the truth is he's there. And the reason why he's there is because he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he, Christ was obligated to actually take Mike to heaven when he died. And when you look into the Bible, there are three reasons why Jesus Christ was obligated to take Mike to heaven when he died because he believed in him. First of all... Christ was obligated to take him to heaven because of the price he paid. I'm reading from John 3, 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. I'm going to pay the price for the sin, and whoever believes in me will be saved. When you go back to the illustration that Jesus uses, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, we discover that according to the verb tense, all you have to do is look one time to that cross to save you. All you have to do is look one time to the cross, and the moment that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are forever saved. One of the things that uh, Mike actually had on his possession in his final moments of life was a cross Karen had given to him. I don't know for sure, but I'm sure that there were moments when he physically looked at it, but it wasn't that that saved him. It was the fact that in 2002, he spiritually went to that cross by faith. Now, if you were in debt for $1 million and somebody said, here's a check that'll cover your entire debt, plus there's enough in this check to cover all the debt you'll ever have in the future, you'd be foolish not to take that check. I tell you, Christ went to that cross and he offers you your entire sin debt fully paid. And he says to you, if you'll receive me, no matter what you go through in life, no matter what happens to you in life, no matter how you die, I will take you to heaven because I have paid the price for you. I died on that cross for you. Mike believed on the Lord. Christ was obligated to take him to heaven because of the price he paid for him. Secondly, Christ was obligated to take Mike to heaven because of the promise he made to him. He said in John, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said, I am promising you this. I'm promising you that if you believe on me, I will come and I will take you to be where I am. That's the promise he made. Jesus Christ is God. He can't go back on his word. He promises that whoever believes on him will have life. He promises that he'll take him to heaven. So Christ was obligated to take Mike to heaven the moment he believed on Jesus Christ because of the price he paid and because of the promise he made. And thirdly, he was obligated to take him to heaven because of the prayer Christ prayed. In John 17, there's a remarkable prayer that Jesus makes for people who would believe on him. And here's what he says. Father, I desire that they also, who thou hast given me, be with me where I am in order that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. Christ said, I want all of my family in heaven with me, even those who have become a little confused. 
I want all of my family to be here with me in heaven so they can see me in all of my glory. He specifically prayed that prayer for everyone who would believe on him, and he specifically prayed that God the Father would take his entire family to heaven. And that's where Mike is. He's there because when he made that decision to believe on Jesus Christ, the Godhead was obligated to fulfill their promise and take him to heaven. They paid the price for him. Christ promised that he would do that, and he prayed that it would happen. Now, in many ways, Mike Doe was a good man, a wonderful man. He had some great qualities, but I tell you this, that's not why he's in heaven. In fact, the last act that he did on earth was a sinful act. The reason that we will all die is because death is a penalty for sin. We've all sinned, and therefore we've received the death penalty. That's why every one of us, if the Lord tarries, will die. Because none of us are perfect, and we're all going to die as a penalty that we received as one man sin, death passed to one man, to all men for all of sin. So not only did Mike have the death penalty because he was a sinner, he actually died sinning. So the, why, the reason why he's in heaven is not because of the fact he was a good man or did good things in his final moment of life. He's in heaven because he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is obligated to take you to heaven. And the same God that allowed Mike to enter his heaven will allow you to enter his heaven if you believe. See, what we are faced with here is that going to heaven cannot possibly be based on your works. Going to heaven is based on Christ's work. And when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are guaranteed everlasting life. May we pray. It would be a wonderful thing if Mike were to learn that someone trusted the Lord at his memorial service. The scriptures teach that heaven rejoices when someone does that. I'm not going to embarrass you. We, we ended the service the day Mike trusted the Lord with these words. If you're here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, right where you sit, you invite him into your life right now to be your personal Savior. Just pray something like this. God, I know I'm a sinner. I thank you that Christ went to that cross for me and paid the price. And right now I invite him into my life to save me. Our Father, we are so thankful that no matter what hits us, you are still our God. We are so thankful that you are still a God who cares for us. And we are so thankful for grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. We rejoice in the fact that Mike is in heaven but we especially ask that you would grant your special comforting grace and peace to Karen and to the family and to his friends and to our church. Lord, it was a privilege to know him. We'll look forward to seeing him again one day. For anything that you've accomplished in this service that is of eternal value, we want to thank you and praise you because you're the God who did it. In Jesus' name, amen.